while we're moving towards Easter with conversations on the cross, we're trying to figure out what does that symbol mean? What happened on the cross? And we're, of course, reading the Bible as we do that. We're also using this stained glass as a kind of a roadmap for our discussion. This is the Wales window of Alabama. It was given by the people of Wales to the 16th Street Baptist Church in uh, Birmingham, Alabama in 1963, following the racially motivated bombing of that church and the tragic death of four African-American girls. At the cross of Jesus, what we've learned so far is first of all, that we're loved. We looked at the face. Uh, secondly, that we're forgiven. We looked at the caption, you do it to me. Uh, thirdly, that we're rectified. We looked at the left hand, learned a new word, uh, rectified, made right. And then last Sunday, a beautiful sermon, powerful that, that uh, Pastor Lori Brenner preached to us. We learned that we're empowered. We see this image is lifting off the cross with resurrection uh, power. If you haven't caught all these messages, I'd encourage you to go back and, and pick ones you missed up because it's really under, important to understand that the cross is rich in its meaning. There are many different things going on there. It's important to see it all. Today, we're going to focus in on Jesus's right hand, this, this hand here, his right hand. And let me ask you, what do you see in it? What do you notice? If you have children with you, you might ask them, what do you see in Jesus's hand? What does it look like he's doing there? He's kind of got it, kind of got it putting, it's behind him, isn't it? And it's sort of open like that. This, this, have you ever seen a hand like that? Has anyone, has, as a parent, ever hold that up to you? Maybe you're jumping on the couch or, or maybe you see a crossing guard at school do that to cars. What, what, is that, what does that mean? What does that mean? Stop, right? It means stop. But stop what? would Jesus be suggesting here? Stop what? Well, let me tell you a story about this window. See, this is a new window, 1963, but there was one before that. And the window in that place at the 16th Street Baptist Church before this one, it was also a picture of Jesus. There was no cross. Jesus was standing by a door and his face was happy, it was glowing. And if you look at his right hand carefully, it's a relaxed hand. It's kind of resting against the front of the door just like this. And so what do you think he was doing? Well, probably knocking, right? That's kind of what we do with a door and a, a fist, knocking. What does it mean when you're knocking on a door? Well, it means start. It means, hey, let's start conversation. Let's start friendship. Let's start a, a, a time together. Now, what happened, uh, unfortunately, was something very bad. And something hard flew against that window and it made a hole. It actually, the, the piece of a hard thing hit right in the face of Jesus. And so where Jesus' face had been, glowing and smiling, just this big, scary hole there. And the people at that church didn't want things like that to happen in their church anymore. It was scary, and they, they wanted it to stop. And so when the people of Wales put their money together and an artist created a new window, they gave the church a picture of Jesus on the cross. And his right hand was saying, stop. Stop bad things. Stop the evil. This is Jesus defending us. This is the powerful, mighty right hand of God turned against evil. Do you see how large it is? See how firm it is? Stop. But it's really not the hand that does that. It's the cross of Jesus. The cross of Jesus is a stake in the heart of evil. That's the title of this message. And it's, it's interesting to me that we find ourselves in the middle of this epidemic that stems from bats. And if you know that expression of putting a stake in the heart, uh, it's, a, it's a means of killing a vampire, which is also associated with bats. And I was just thinking about that this morning how weird it is that I came up with this sermon title in July, knowing nothing about this. But it's like the Lord was giving this to us to say, I am your defender. Let the evil stop. 
John of Damascus, reflecting on the cross, says this, we venerate the cross of Christ by which the power of the demons and the deceit of the devil were destroyed. Stop. We have a defender. Well, let's look at our text. Uh, the Hobarts read this earlier for us. It's Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 46. You might open a Bible or uh, navigate on a device over to this passage of Scripture. What we find in this little scene is the language of a battlefield. A battlefield. Historically, Christians have referred to this scene as uh, ag the agony in the garden. Uh, agony. It's the word translated anguish in what the Hobarts read earlier, anguish. In his anguish, Jesus prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. In his anguish. King James says, in his agony. Now, when we hear that word agony, uh, we, we think about distress. And it is a distressing moment, but it's actually a military word. The Greek word that's here is agonia, and it, it refers to combat, agonia. It's fighting language. Normally in the New Testament, it's a verb, and it's translated variously, strive, compete, struggle, wrestle, oppose, contend, fight, even conquer. So you, you could translate verse 44 here, and coming into battle, Jesus prayed more intensely. And coming into battle, see, that's the agony. And coming into battle, Jesus prayed more intensely. That's why we see this comparison that's made between sweat and blood, because that's what happens in a battle. The blood is a foreshadow of the cost of this battle and the cross. So the agony in the garden is a battle. And if that's the case, then Jesus is a warrior. This is a different way of looking at Jesus for many of us. We tend to think of him, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, as Wesley says. Uh, but this is an apocalyptic Jesus. This is a sweaty, bloody Jesus. This is an Under Armour commercial Jesus. He's ready to rumble. This is a Jesus that you would not want to meet in a back alley. And we shouldn't be surprised because this is the way Jesus would oftentimes speak of himself. He says, I'm the one who's come into the world to bind the strong man and to plunder his house. The very first Christian sermon that was ever preached was preached by Peter, you know, on Pentecost Sunday. And he, he said that Jesus is, sorry about that. That's real life there. I thought I was on, yeah, an important person just tried to call. The first sermon that was ever preached was preached by Peter on Pentecost Sunday. And he described Jesus, the risen Savior, as a warrior. He, he tells us that God says to Jesus, I will put your enemies under your feet as a footstool. And Peter's referring to Psalm 110, which describes the Son of God as a warrior. It's actually the most frequently quoted psalm in all of the New Testament, Psalm 110. Your enemies will be your footstool, the Lord says. So this is a picture of Jesus between the world and bad things. This is a, a picture of Jesus raising the mighty right hand of God to say, stop. This is Jesus, a defender. So children... I would love to ask you to think of someone in your life who's a defender. Can you think of somebody who defends you or, or other people? Maybe you're thinking of a person or a pet or a superhero. If you'd like, pull out a piece of paper and draw a picture of that person defending somebody. I would encourage you to share that picture with your family after worship. You might even take a picture of it and send it to us and we can fold it into our slideshow next week. But here's the question, who is Jesus fighting? We know that Jesus never hurts people, and we don't see any enemy in this garden. It's a garden. Who is he fighting? Well, the answer is this. Jesus contends with a spiritual power. Jesus contends with a spiritual power. This is what he's trying to tell his disciples. 
as they come into the garden, remember in verse 40, he says, pray that you may not come into the time of trial or temptation. Now, he might be referring to the soldiers who, who will soon arrest Jesus and the temptation to defect and disown Jesus. But there's something deeper that he seems to be getting at. And he makes that clear in verse 53, when the soldiers do come, Jesus refers to the power of darkness, power of darkness. And he said earlier what the real enemy is in verse 31, he gives it a name, Satan, he says, Satan. Now, as a modern person, I start to feel uncomfortable with this kind of language. Maybe you do. We rarely think of evil as a metaphysical identity, much less give it a, a name uh, like Jesus does. Jesus seems to think of evil as a, at least a personal agent and a name, Satan. For us, we don't think of evil this way. Uh, when we see bad things, we tend to say, oh, somebody made a bad choice or yeah, they're making bad decisions. And the implication seems to be if they would just say stop or someone would just say stop, then bad things would go away. And I, I suppose thinking this way gives us some kind of sense of control, maybe a reassurance that, well, we're the kind of people that say stop to bad things, and so that would never actually happen to us. But if you think about that, it's a, it's a little bit condescending to suggest that all other people who are suffering need to do is simply say, stop. It's patronizing. And, and beyond that, it's, a, it's not always realistic. Sometimes it seems we just don't have the power ourselves to say stop to bad things. I know that we found this as a family. People could have looked at our family and said, oh, they're really not very good parents. Or, oh, that child's making bad choices. But there's some truth to that, but it doesn't give a account to the fullness of what was going on there. It was too simplistic and falls flat. I wonder if I'm making sense to you. Let me give you two examples. Ben Affleck, speaking of himself in a New York Times interview he gave just a few weeks ago, speaks of cycles of violence that were trapping him. He couldn't get out of. He says this, you're trying to make yourself feel better with eating or drinking or sex or gambling or shopping or whatever, but that ends up making your life worse, and then you do more of it to make that discomfort go away. Then the real pain starts. It becomes a vicious cycle you can't break. That's at least what happened to me, close quote. What he's saying is he can't just say stop. And then just a week later, also in the New York Times uh, a woman named Sarah Miller with heartbreaking writing talks about her struggle uh, with body image. And she writes this, my weight has probably occupied 50% of my thinking for my entire life. Yes, I've been to therapy, so much of it. And no, I do not think this mental state is fine or even okay. What it is, is intractable. It means it won't stop. She says, I'm 50 and I'm way too scared of the world to stop dieting. They got me, and they will never let me go. What's she saying? She's saying, I can't say stop. And so we ask, who is this? Who is this they that have got a hold of Sarah Miller and won't, won't let her go? What is this persistent discomfort that Affleck mentions. Andrew Del Banco has written a book called The Death of Satan. He's a professor at Columbia University in New York City. He argues that, quote, a gulf has opened up in our culture between the visibility of evil and the intellectual resources available for coping with it. See, we see the evil, but we don't have intellectual resources to cope with it anymore. This is interesting. The Death of Satan is the title of, of his book. Now, he's, he's not arguing as a, as a believer, uh, but what he's doing is suggesting that when we see bad things in the world, we're much more likely attributed to social conditioning, psychological deprivation, biochemistry. And Del Banco is arguing that secular liberals, and he considers himself a secular liberal, have lost any concept of what he calls radical evil. 
Now, historically, when Christians have looked to the cross of Jesus Christ, this is exactly what they have seen. Radical evil. Because here in the cross, we have Jesus universally regarded as the truest of all human beings, the greatest teacher, healer, and leader, the Son of God, many affirm, killed, murdered. For what? This is radical evil. What is it that confronts our Savior on the cross? Not just the personal guilt and insecurity of individuals in the crowd who say, crucify him. Not just the hypocrisy and destructiveness of institutionalized religion of those who accuse him. Not just the systemic political oppression of the Roman Empire that strings him up. But in the language of the New Testament, principalities and powers the forces of this evil age, this present darkness. That's what Jesus called it. He's referring to a spiritual enemy. Jesus is contending with a spiritual power. Why? Because he's confronted it with his love. Because he's aggravated it with his healing. Because he's provoked it with what may have been his most frequent miracle certainly the one that we as modern people most overlook, and that is countless exorcisms of evil spirits. The cross is the climax in a spiritual battle with the spiritual power. How else do we explain the fierceness and the brutality of the murder? And what else will answer for the tyranny and the brokenness of life in this planet, the cycles of war and genocide and hunger, uh, the harm to children, the degradation of the planet, dehumanization. Flannery O'Connor, the great writer, wrote in a letter to a friend, our salvation is played out with the devil, a devil who is not simply generalized evil, but an evil intelligence determined on its own supremacy. Close quote. She's talking about the cross. She's talking about the powerful right hand of God in Jesus Christ defending us. Jesus says to his disciples that night in the garden, pray that you may not come into the time of trial or temptation. And this suggests to us that you and I will contend with a spiritual enemy too. I remember years ago when we had a young child at home, he came into our into my home office and I, I see on his face this look of grave concern. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, dad, I'm too tempted. I, I said, what do, you, what do you mean? He said, well, well, mom baked cookies and she left them on the counter and I'm too tempted. And I could smell the fresh baked cookies wafting, you know, kind of through the open door that he had left. And I said, well, why don't you just have one? And he said, she said, no, I'm too tempted. Apparently he'd kind of come to his limitations and had fled the scene because he didn't have power to stop himself from taking one of those cookies. Kind of an interesting moment for me. I thought about that. I admired that in him. What would you have said to to that boy? St. Peter says this. Remember, St. Peter was in the garden with Jesus that night. He says, discipline yourselves, speaking to Christians, discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him steadfast in your faith. I like that. Steadfast in your faith. How do we resist the enemy's temptations? As modern people, we don't give much thought to questions like that. Perhaps it's good for us to go back in history and read the works of those who are passed away now, but who did think more about the powers of darkness. For example, a man named Thomas Brooks was a pastor in England, and he wrote a little book called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. It was kind of an expose on how the enemy approaches us and gets his hooks into us. 
Let me just share five of them so you get a sense of this. These are five things that the enemy tries to do. And I wonder if any of these are at all familiar to you. When you face temptation and you're saying, I'm too tempted, do any of these things ever happen to you? The first thing the enemy might do is he shows the bait and hides the hook. He shows the bait, hides the hook, makes sin look appealing, doesn't let us see the consequences. It's like the enemy says, look at how beautiful this trinket is. Another one, number two, the enemy presents God to the soul as all mercy. So the enemy was saying, come on, God is eager to forgive. Why make such a big deal of this? As though God doesn't really care about doing anything other than just forgiving. Number three, the enemy induces you to compare yourself with those who seem worse. Ah, come on. This isn't as bad as what they do. You're much better than they are. Don't really worry about it. You're still good. Number four, the enemy focuses the soul on the freedom from outward miseries of those walking in sin. You look down the street, you see people who are not believers, and something whispers in your ear, hey, they're living a pretty good life. They've got a lot going for them. You might as well get over your moral hang-ups. Number five, the enemy reminds you of your frequent relapses into sin formerly repented of and prayed against. Just when you think you got over that, you're growing in your faith and no longer doing that, there's this voice that says, come on, here we go again. You always go back to this pond. Might as well go as quickly as possible and get it over with. See, these are, these are temptations. These are devices that the enemy uses to trap us. In each of them, the idea is that there are thoughts in our heads, and those thoughts in our heads don't necessarily come from our heads. Perhaps they come from another source. And just because I believe them doesn't mean that they are true. Fyodor Dostoevsky in The Brothers Karamazov writes, the devil is struggling with God, and the battlefield is the human heart. He's talking about my heart. He's talking about your heart. It's a battlefield. So how do we engage a spiritual enemy on a battlefield in the heart? How do we do it? Well, it's interesting to read Thomas Brooks for each of these. He has remedies and describes things we can do, and then they're helpful. But the bottom line for all of them is essentially turn to Jesus. Turn to the one who's our defender. And this is what St. Peter's saying as well in that same passage where he's talking about our adversary, the lion prowling about. He says very simply, Cast your cares on him, Jesus, because he cares for you. Turn to someone stronger than you who cares for you. Somebody who has the authority to say stop. And by the way, this is what our child did, isn't it? He ran into my office because he knew I loved him. And he knew that when he couldn't say stop, he would find someone stronger, someone who had the authority to say stop. And that protected him. And so Jesus here in the garden tells his followers to pray. He says, pray, come before that one who loves you. Come before that one who has the authority to look at the bad and say, stop. Pray that you may not come into a time of trial. He he says it twice. Did you notice in the passage? He, He really believes it. He repeats it. And in between those two sayings, he, he falls to his knees himself, and he himself, in his moment of temptation, prays to the Father. Father, he says, Father. Prayer. I see a resurgence of prayer at UPC. I feel it in my life, uh, I, I, even before COVID-19, but now especially with COVID-19, we're praying. Our city is praying, and it's so important that we do. I'm thankful for this resurgence. In an earlier age, Richard Sibbs wrote, when we go to God by prayer, the devil knows we go to fetch strength against him, and therefore he opposes us all he can. So don't be surprised when it's hard to find time or will to pray. Sibbs is saying the devil knows this is the very thing that he can't afford to let you do. 
Samuel Chadwick says, Satan dreads nothing but prayer. His one concern is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. He trembles when we pray. At the cross, we come before one who is a defender. But not just a defender. We come to one who is a victor, the one who wins. At the cross, you see, Jesus drives a stake into the heart of evil. He wins. Not just his battle, your battle, all battles. And this is what the followers of Jesus understood, though they didn't know how he would do it. When he speaks to them these words in the garden, they see more than we see because Jesus used a word in that moment that was like a code word for cosmic revolution. And that word is trial. It, it escapes us. But to Jewish ears, the word trial at this point in history referred to the end time cataclysm that was coming. At that moment at the end of time when the forces of evil would rise up and be defeated by the forces of good, when God would come through the anointed one, through the Messiah, and destroy the enemy and the evil of the world to make the world right the way it's supposed to be. The surprise in this text is that he didn't do it at the end of history, but he did it right here in the middle of history. He did it on the cross. So the New Testament writers are, go on and on at length to describe this. We read, for example, in Colossians 2.14, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in the cross. And we read in Hebrews 2, 14, through death, he destroyed the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. I guess at this point, it's important for us to notice that after the cross, the world has changed. That's what really matters here. Evil has been defeated. Satan has been defeated. Our enemy has been humiliated on the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, let me also say, evil has been defeated, but it's not gone, is it? No, the evil is real, and we're experiencing in a powerful way right now around the world. But for people who know Jesus and who've said yes to Jesus, we're like the people of Breslau, Poland. Breslau, Poland was the last place in Europe that the war stopped. They kept fighting in Breslau, Poland, long after Adolf Hitler was dead. The struggle continued, even though the war was over. In that sense, we're not only like the people of Breslau, Poland, we're also like the sailors of a mutiny, sailing on a great ship where, where, where we've mutinied against a cruel captain. And that captain will still bark out accusations and orders, but now to no effect because he's tied to the mast. And we may forget that he's tied, forget that he's bound, be compelled by his influence, but we need not because he's been defeated. In the end, Satan overplayed his hand. That's what's going on on the cross. On Friday, he let his fury pour out on the Son of God. Jesus was in his teeth. On Saturday, Holy Saturday, dark Saturday, Satan danced on his tomb. But Sunday, but Sunday, as Satan is hung over, after all of his fury had been spent, after his clip was empty, on Sunday, the enemy heard rejoicing. They were singing in Jerusalem. The tombs of Jerusalem had released the dead. And the defender of all creation now walks among his people with joy. In the end, I guess what matters is not so much what you've done, but what he's done. You have a defender. In the end, life isn't a question of who you are, but whose you are. We belong to the one with authority to say stop to bad things 
to say stop to substance abuse, to stay, say stop to body shaming, to say stop to disease. And more than that, we belong to the one who has the authority to open the door to a new relationship with God and say start. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we do pray. We pray all the more earnestly as we come before the cross of our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we move through this garden ourselves and pass before its shadow, we find ourselves devastated. We find ourselves come into crisis because we know we're not only revolutionaries, but we're also those who committed treason. We know the darkness in our own hearts. And we know that we have lost the power to say no to that darkness. But we also know that this is not a cross of condemnation for us. For here, Jesus has come for us to save our sins. Jesus has come to defend us in his grace. And so this is a symbol of liberation that invites us to stop that which does not help and start that which truly brings life and a new way of life. So that we pray you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us to strengthen us in our prayer today and in the days to come that we might be people of the revolution. That those who, of us who know ourselves to be defended might come and defend others in their time of need. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, claiming his authority and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.